Centuries ago, the lush jungles of South America fueled rumors of a lost civilization and a priceless hoard of gold. The Spanish called it El Dorado. Now, a new breed of explorer is on the trail of another treasure. Millions of years ago, dinosaurs conquered South America in weird and unexpected ways. Today, scientists are uncovering the secrets of a lost world that no human being has ever seen. South America, 250 million years ago. The sun rises on a deathly calm. As far as the eye can see, the land appears desolate and empty. The only sounds are of wind and the pattern of rain in a primeval forest. wake of the worst natural disaster in history, most of life on Earth has vanished. Whether an asteroid or an Earth-bound catastrophe did it, no one knows. But it will change the course of evolution. Among the survivors are a handful of sluggish four-footed reptiles. Some, like cow turtles, are plant eaters. Others, like armor-plated gator lizards, are long-legged carnivores that walk like modern crocodiles. For the next 20 million years, they and their kind fill the void left by the great extinction. Then, a new reign of terror begins. But this one is different. Something stirs in the forest. It's small, but agile and moving fast. Running on two hind legs, it lunges for its startled victim. The first of a new breed of predator, its descendants will rule the land for the next 160 million years. Today, the primordial killing fields of South America have disappeared, leaving behind one of the most spectacular geological formations on Earth. At the foot of the Andes in northwest Argentina lies a lunar landscape 50 miles long and 900 feet thick. the Valley of the Moon, it dates back an astonishing 230 million years to the time when dinosaurs first appeared. Surrounded by flaming red cliffs a mile high, it looks like the last place on Earth to search for ancient life. But for fossil hunters, this is the Garden of Eden, the place where it all began. In 1988, a joint team of Argentinian and American scientists came here on a quest to find the holy grail of paleontology, the first dinosaur. In the valley that you have a, a whole series of badlands, uh, as you walk across, you're walking across millions of years uh, from uh, a time when dinosaurs were just appearing to a time when they took over. There's no, no place like it anywhere else on Earth. The prime candidate was a creature called Herrerasaurus. First discovered in 1918, fragments of it litter the valley, but no skeleton or skull has ever been found. The team hoped that Herrerasaurus would solve a mystery that has puzzled scientists for over a century. 
what is a dinosaur and where did they come from? Did they evolve from a single common ancestor or a hodgepodge of different creatures? But a grueling six-week search revealed nothing. Then, team leader Paul Serino of the University of Chicago followed a hunch. He took a crew to a previously unexplored part of the valley, and there he hit it big. The discovery of the first skull and, and good skeleton of Herrerasaurus was one of the most cherished moments of my career, uh, going down to South America, discovering something uh, that you were shooting for, was just uh, viewed as an impossibility. And when we did it, um, and it was there in the ground, uh, something that's 230 million years old, at the surface for only a few years. Uh, it was so thrilling, uh, I, I just broke down when I found it. It was one of the most amazing experiences of my career. When the sediments beneath Herrerasaurus were dated, they turned out to be from the Triassic, the first of three geological time periods that began 245 million years ago. The second period was the famous Jurassic, which spanned 63 million years. And the last was called the Cretaceous, which ended 65 million years ago. Together, these three periods make up the Mesozoic, the age of reptiles. Because the valley of the moon has been tilted up by geological forces, a cross-section exposes the rocks of these successive ages from the time before dinosaurs appeared to the end of the Triassic. Because Herrerasaurus was buried in Triassic rock, Serino knew it had to be one of the most primitive dinosaurs yet known. The length of a car, but lighter in weight than a small pony, it was a meat eater with an appetite for anything from small lizards to plant eaters the size of pigs. This was a fast, agile creature. Its head was narrow, its jaw lined with sharp backward curving teeth, ideal for grabbing onto large prey. But its real strength was in the design. Its two powerful hind legs would take the Triassic world by storm. American paleontologist William Sill knows that the Valley of the Moon is a time capsule of evolution. He moved here in 1978 to hunt for dinosaurs and encouraged Sereno to prospect here too. Since working with Sereno, he's become an expert on early dinosaurs and why they ruled the world for 160 million years. This is the leg bone of Herrerasaurus, one of the secret weapons that allowed the dinosaurs to become so successful. If you notice the bone is in an upright position with a ball and socket joint that allowed it to be agile and vertical, which provided two elements, speed and agility, while the rest of the animals at that time had their limbs out to the side and rotated them like this. Compared to a lumbering four-legged reptile like today's Komodo dragon, Herrerasaurus was a thoroughbred. But its two-legged upright stance gave it another advantage. The other secret weapon was this. Once the animal is completely upright, that frees the hands, which can then be used for grasping and grabbing, and the development of these huge claws, which if you'll notice are twice the size of the claws of a grizzly bear. With these two weapons, dinosaurs were able to take over the world with a technology that no other group of animals had at that time. Herrerasaurus was clearly hands and heads above its contemporaries. That's what bothered Paul Serino. It was too advanced. A very strange thing appeared in the lower jaw. It was so polished it looked like a tooth. And we later would understand that that wasn't a tooth, but it was the end of a bone. 
bone that formed the important joint in the middle of the lower jaw, which allowed the joint, the, the lower jaw to flex. We eventually came to understand that this characterized all predatory dinosaurs and was a fundamental feature which allowed them to track down and keep in their jaws uh, live prey. The discovery was a revelation. Its sophisticated jaw meant that Herrerasaurus may have been one of the first meat eaters, but it was not the common ancestor of all dinosaurs. Three years later, in 1991, Paul Serino returned to Argentina. Somewhere out there, a more primitive creature was waiting to be discovered. The Valley of the Moon is as vast as it is ancient. But even to the trained eye, tracking down a dinosaur is no easy task. Finding bones less than a foot long in an area of 200 square miles is part luck and part skill. Serino had found a needle in a haystack. Now he needed to find another. But this time it was team member Ricardo Martinez who stumbled on the impossible. the skeleton of an unknown dinosaur far more primitive than Herrerasaurus. He christened it Eoraptor, meaning dawn predator. A two-legged meat eater less than four feet long with a slashing hand and sharp claws that lived side by side with Herrerasaurus, feeding on small lizard-like reptiles. Eoraptor's skeleton was a rare find, but in a rock the size of a baseball was the real prize, its skull. When I was rushing, I found a small pit. At this moment, I understand that I have in my hand a whole skull. It was amazing. It was the best day of my life. For a paleontologist, it's the skull that tells the tale. Skull is the center for how it processes food. You can immediately look at the sharp teeth of a meat eater, or the various uh, cutting and grinding teeth of a plant eater, and say something about how they're processing food, critical for what powers the animal. You also see the skull as the site of all its senses, basically sight, smell, hearing. Uh, these are all controlling how the animal behaves, how it perceives its environment, and they're critical to its way of life. In the case of Eoraptor, it wasn't what the skull had that was revealing, but what it was missing. Although it was a carnivore, it lacked the flexible joint in its lower jaw, which all predatory dinosaurs had. The question is why? Serino thinks Eoraptor branched off the family tree before the feature evolved. If so, Eoraptor was far older than Herrerasaurus. Eoraptor comes closer to that common ancestor. It's the correct size, uh, a meter or three feet in length. It has a predatory habit. We think that the earliest dinosaur had a predatory habit. Later, they became herbivorous, some of them. So Eoraptor really captures, uh, better than any other dinosaur we've found so far, what this ancestral dinosaur would look like. Two hundred and thirty million years ago, nature invented a dinosaur that would become the blueprint for some of the most awesome creatures that ever lived. In 1912, Arthur Conan Doyle, the creator of Sherlock Holmes, put aside the adventures of his famous detective to write one of the greatest adventures in science fiction, The Lost World. Set in the Amazon jungle, it weaves a fantastic tale of an expedition to an isolated plateau where the prehistoric world is frozen in time. Lord John was standing at gaze with his finger on the trigger of his gun. 
his eager hunter's soul shining from his fierce eyes. In size, they were enormous. The Lost World captured the imagination of millions. Few realized that when dinosaurs walked the Earth, humans didn't exist. And when dinosaurs first appeared, South America didn't exist. A time traveler going back 230 million years wouldn't recognize planet Earth. Viewed from space, one half of the Earth was all ocean, the other almost all land. One giant continent called Pangaea extended along the equator and stretched from the north to the south pole. To the far left lay South America. Its coast was moist and warm, while inland was a desert of sand dunes and soda lakes. But a seasonal climate brought rain to swell the floodplains and nurture forests of tree ferns and giant evergreens. For dinosaurs growing up in South America during the Triassic, life was good and food was plentiful. Along a stream, a large four-footed plant eater grazes in the treetops. Nearby, a newly designed predator is watching and waiting. Discovered in 1997, this killer was found 200 miles north of the Valley of the Moon, near the town of La Rioja. At its university, Andrea Arcucci has begun the daunting task of freeing it from its rocky grave. This is the skull of uh, a new dinosaur that we call Supaisaurus, that means uh, devil reptile. Arcucci has only the skull to work with, but already it speaks volumes about the evolution of the first dinosaurs. The Oraptor's skull was so small it could fit in the palm of a hand. The skull of Herrerasaurus was the size of a football. Several million years later, Zupasaurus was sporting a skull two and a half feet long. Based on this, Arcucci calculates that Zupasaurus must have been up to 16 feet long. Like its predecessors, it had backward curving teeth, only this time the bite was bigger. But a predator has to be fast. To accommodate the increase in size without sacrificing speed, Zupasaurus unveiled a new concept in design. Cavities in its skull, where once there had been solid bone, streamlined the dinosaur's skeleton, making it lighter. We could say that this creature was like a tiger in the Triassic. Zupasaurus is a vital link in the chain of dinosaur evolution. It shows that in the waning years of the Triassic, some predators were getting bigger, faster, and meaner. A global extinction 245 million years ago inaugurated the Triassic and cleared the way for the rise of the dinosaurs. Now another would correct their course and usher in the age of the Jurassic. The great supercontinent of Pangaea began to crack. Rifts appeared in the Indian and Atlantic oceans, unleashing an outpouring of lava from the Earth's interior and creating tidal waves the size of buildings. Before the dust settled, half the world's reptiles had vanished. but most of the dinosaurs survived unscathed. By the end of the Jurassic period, 142 million years ago, the modern continents began to take shape. Splitting away from Africa, South America slowly drifted westward. The breakup of Pangaea would have a profound impact on the evolution of the dinosaurs. If you want to evolve, 
If you want to get a continent to sprout lots of different kinds of animals, including dinosaurs, you need isolation. If you want a new species of Triceratops, a Brontosaurus, of Hummingbird, you've got to take a small population, isolate it from its close kin, give it enough time to evolve its own adaptive signature, and then release it. Without isolation, you won't get new species. With the coming of the Cretaceous, South America was becoming greener, warmer, and more fertile. The most dramatic change was the arrival of flowering plants, broadleaf trees, and grasses. Set adrift from the rest of the world, South America's dinosaurs would now forge their own unique destiny. In Argentina's capital, Buenos Aires, at the Natural History Museum, resides a creature found nowhere else on Earth. At first glance, it looks like your basic meat eater, but there the similarity ends. Paleontologist Jose Bonaparte uncovered this toothy killer in 1971. We excavated the animal from the back to the front. And then, after three weeks of excavating and collecting the hind limb and front limb and the vertebra and so on, we reached the skull. And uh, we all were very surprised and very happy because it was a quite unuseful skull. What made it so unusual was its short snout and the horns on top of its head. Its skull reminded Bonaparte of another animal, so he christened it Carnotaurus, the meat-eating bull. A medium-sized predator, Carnotaurus measured 25 feet from snout to tail. His arms were tiny, but his legs were long and thin, which made him a graceful hunter. But how he used his horns, Bonaparte could only guess. I suspect that this rounded horn, very much like those of the bull, was very useful to kill while fighting or to kill the prey. If meat eaters like Carnotaurus were peculiar, the plant eaters that roamed South America were downright bizarre. Giants called sauropods known for their monstrous bodies and legs as thick as tree trunks populated North America during the Jurassic. But after a reign of 60 million years, the changing winds of the Cretaceous spelled their doom and they eventually died out. Almost everywhere. The end of the Jurassic. Just before the Cretaceous begins, all over North America and Europe, Northern Asia too, all of the giant long necks get whacked, get wiped out. This was a sudden event, but there was a refuge. In South America, there were residual populations of long necks, which not only got as big as the Jurassic long necks, but they got bigger still. plains of Patagonia in central Argentina, there once was a dinosaur so large that when it moved, the earth trembled and the ground shook. This is a human backbone. It's three inches high and weighs three ounces. It's sitting on another backbone that's 400 times larger, five feet tall, it weighs a ton. The discovery of this mammoth fossil in 1987 sparked a quest to find what may be the largest creature that ever lived, Argentinosaurus. Since 1987, 10 more bones have been recovered, all equally colossal. On display in the local museum in the city of Plaza Huancal, in central Argentina, they tell only part of the story. 
Argentinosaurus remains frustratingly incomplete. I don't think that I have enough life for finish the work. I trust in my students, even my daughter or grandsons. These dirt bikers call themselves Los Perros del Desierto, the dogs of the desert. They live and work in the town of Rincón de los Sauces, but on weekends they head for the outback in search of excitement. In the summer of 1996, they found it. At the museum in Plaza Huancao, the phone rings often with word of a new discovery. In the hope of finding more of Argentinosaurus, Coria follows up on every call. Most are dead ends, but today is his lucky day. No time to spare, he heads for Rincón, an eight-hour drive away. This was to be the most important journey of his life. A few miles out of town, in the middle of nowhere, the bikers stumbled on the bones of a dinosaur. Although it's a desert now, during the Cretaceous, water ran through it, leaving behind an ancient riverbed of pebbly sandstone. At the spot where the bones were found, Coria instantly recognizes the shin of a giant sauropod just like Argentinosaurus. <laughs> Brushing away the sand, he can't believe his eyes. Not one bone, but a whole skeleton is lying where the dinosaur fell some 70 million years ago. It looks like Argentinosaurus. If so, it's a first. No complete skeleton of a titanosaur has ever been found. Well, we're always thrilled when a fossil is complete from the tip of its nose to the end of its tail, but uh, nature is rarely so kind to us, and parts often uh, come, uh, come away from a skeleton, and one of the first parts to come away is the skull, because the skull is, because it's a mobile, it turns and twists, it drops off. The skull is, is fragile, it breaks into pieces, and it's often lost. Would this skeleton have the rarest of all fossils, its skull? Sauropods had brains the size of golf balls, so their skulls were small and hard to preserve. But a skull remains the best clue to a dinosaur's identity. At last, the first skull of a titanosaur. Coria's dream had finally come true. With a little imagination, we can now see what Argentinosaurus would have looked like. This is the shin bone of Argentinosaurus. It's five feet long. It can help us to see how big this creature really was. Based on the size of the shin bone, Coria is able to reconstruct Argentinosaurus from the ground up. He knows Titanosaurus had shorter front legs than back legs. And he knows their bodies were big, really big. If Argentinosaurus was still alive today, space in this town would be a big problem. Argentinosaurus was as tall as an eight-story building and nearly half the length of a football field. A hundred tons 
of flesh and bone, it made the earth tremble and its enemies shudder. The best thing in being so enormous is that you are afraid of nothing. Well, almost nothing. It only makes sense that if you've got a sauropod that big, you need a carnivore that's going to be big enough to take it down. Uh, enter Giganotosaurus. A killer bigger and heavier than Tyrannosaurus rex, Giganotosaurus was to spread terror throughout South America for millions of years. century, a dinosaur found only in North America, Tyrannosaurus rex, reigned as king of the killer beasts. No one knew that in South America, another, even more terrifying monster was on the loose. Rodolfo Coria is now on its trail deep in the heart of Patagonia, near the town of El Chacon. Summoned here in 1993 by an amateur fossil hunter who'd found some strange bones, Coria had no idea what to expect. But on the first day, he and his team uncovered the thigh bone of a predatory dinosaur. digging revealed most of its skeleton and enough of its skull to know it was not only the largest ever found in South America, but in the world. He named it Giganotosaurus, the giant reptile from the south. It lived a hundred million years ago during the Cretaceous 30 million years before T-Rex. 45 feet long and weighing a crushing 10 tons, it was also larger and heavier than its famous cousin. But the real monster is its skull. At six feet, it's the longest of any known meat eater and just as vicious. Today, Patagonia is a wasteland of sand and scrub. But a hundred million years ago, forests of lush ferns and evergreens blanketed the landscape. Giant sauropods feasted on the treetops, rich pickings for Giganotosaurus, which set its sights on large prey. Unusual for a predator, its eyes were wide apart which meant it lacked the depth perception of more sophisticated killers. Instead, it had to move its head from side to side to get a fix. To compensate, Giganotosaurus developed a different stalking technique. Coria was zeroing in on a diabolical killer. The clincher was its teeth. The teeth are very sharp in the anterior and posterior edges, but at the same time are very narrow. They look, really, they look like uh, sharp teeth. And uh, the use of this kind of teeth is for slicing flesh and muscles, not for breaking bones. Like a shark, it wielded its teeth as a weapon, ambushing its prey then retreated. The attack was swift and unexpected. One thrust of its rapier-sharp teeth is all it takes. Then it backs off and waits. For its victim, the end is slow and painful. Once death has come, Giganotosaurus returns to feast. In 
prehistoric South America, size was everything. 10 million years after Giganotosaurus, during the late Cretaceous, one creature wasn't only getting bigger, it was getting better. There's a new dinosaur, Megaraptor from South America. It is the biggest knife-wielding kickboxer that has ever evolved anywhere. In 1996, paleontologist Fernando Novas found something that would send a chill through even the largest plant eater. Today, he continues to scour this ridge in northwestern Patagonia in hope of finding more of this frightening killer. This is the place where I found the largest raptor in the world, Megaraptor. Megaraptor stalked South America 90 million years ago, the size of a bus. It was 13 feet tall and 25 feet long and used its long tail as a rudder to change directions fast while chasing its prey. Novas based his claim on only a handful of bones, but one was all he needed, a giant claw it would shatter some long-held beliefs about raptors. Because none had ever been found south of the equator, scientists had thought that they only lived in the northern hemisphere. Most were small. The most famous velociraptor was about the size of a man, but it packed a powerful punch. One slash with the giant claws on its hind feet could render a fatal wound two feet long. Velociraptor's claw was three inches long. Megaraptor's was almost five times bigger, a staggering 15 inches. This was Megaraptor's best weapon. With this sharp cutting edge, Megaraptor could slice very easily the belly of its victim, like this can today. One swipe could leave a gash eight feet long. On a warm afternoon during the Cretaceous, two giant sauropods linger at a watering hole, unaware they're being watched. Downwind, not one, but three raptors are ready to strike. Armed with brains and weapons to die for, Megaraptors terrorized the largest plant eaters Argentina had to offer. From the first primitive meat eater to the largest and the smartest, South America's carnivores had finally reached the pinnacle of evolution. For most of their victims, there was little escape. But one inventive creature would find a way. Suddenly, out of the darkness, there swoops something with a swish, like an airplane. When Conan Doyle conjured up his bizarre flying creature in The Lost World, it seemed to belong only in fiction. So some thought. But 600 miles away from the Amazon in Santana, in northeastern Brazil, the bizarre is commonplace. The town sits in the middle of 5,000 square miles of rare fossil-bearing limestone known as the Santana Formation. For the 
past 20 years, paleontologist Dave Martill from England's Portsmouth University has been coming here any way he can. By now, the children of Santana know why Dave is here, and they have plenty to sell. Fossils of small fish and insects are everywhere. But Martill is after bigger prey. Santana is famous for its pterosaurs, more commonly known as pterodactyls. Some are huge, others are puzzling, but all of them are weird. Today, the principal industry in Santana is the manufacture of limestone floor tiles. At the quarry, the limestone is split into sections, a process that often turns up fossils of ancient life. To find them, Martill needs only to sift through the slabs. These huge slabs of limestone were formed at the bottom of an immense saline lake which covered this whole area millions of years ago and dropping out of the sky into this lake were some fantastic insects. Covered by fine sediment before they decayed, insects like scorpions and dragonflies are as lifelike and familiar as if they died yesterday. This is a 100 million year old mayfly. It's almost identical to the mayflies that you find around lakes today. These were the food of some spectacular fishes which lived in a tongue of fresh water over this lake. This is a 100 million year old fish called Dastilbe. And these fishes were the food for the most spectacular animals that ever lived on Earth, the pterodactyls. Pterodactyls aren't dinosaurs nor are they birds. They're flying reptiles. They first appeared during the Triassic period and flourished for 160 million years until the end of the Cretaceous. Some had wingspans of only a foot, but in Brazil they grew to gigantic proportions. Now I estimate the wingspan of this animal to be between 10 and 12 feet. Now that's larger than any living bird, larger than the living albatross. But this is a small pterosaur, this is a baby, compared to some pterodactyls found here in Brazil. A hundred million years ago, during the Cretaceous, Santana was covered by a huge salt lake. The lake was the breeding ground and deathbed of a peculiar group of pterodactyls. The oddest was pterodaustro, meaning the wing from the south. With a four-foot wingspan, it skimmed along the water, filtering food with hundreds of slender teeth set in its upward curving jaw. On the other side of the world, paleontologist Dino Frey is at the receiving end of Santana's fossils. His museum in Karlsruhe, Germany, is a shrine to Brazil's pterodactyls. As his collection grows, so does the size of these remarkable animals. The centerpiece of the museum is a goliath called Quetzalcoatlus named after an Aztec god. For a creature this big to fly must have taken a miracle. This animal here has a wingspan of 35 feet. We found bigger ones, but we possibly haven't found the biggest ones. The only thing we really can prove is that they really flew. Pterodactyls achieved flight because their arms supported a tough membrane that stretched down to the body and hind legs. But it was the unique modification of the hand 
that made all the difference. Their fourth finger grew very large and long. The longer the flight finger, the greater its wingspan. With wings of that construction, it would have been easily possible to fly for hundreds of miles a day without a single wing beat. And it was also possible for them to travel around the world. They could stay airborne because unlike birds, they had light wing membranes instead of heavy feathers. But they also had another advantage. Even the biggest bones in the body, the arm bones, are hollow and have a wall thickness of a few millimeters only. And this is the reason why these giants can stay airborne. Because pterodactyls weighed no more than a man, they could, like hand gliders, heave their giant wings into the wind, catch a warm current of air, and rise into the sky. Yes, they all flew, but many of the South American pterodactyls get crests at the end of their snouts, a, a muzzle-tipped rudder, and a display device to attract other dactyls. Being a dactyl meant a lot of neat visual clues about who was who in society. The biggest high flyer of them all was named after the shape of its menacing beak. This is ram nose, or cryorhynchus. It lived 110 million years ago during the Cretaceous, had an average wingspan of 20 feet, and a skull designed like the keel of a boat. Cryorhynchus would dip its snout into the water and plow through the surface, skimming fish. Research on pterodactyls like Cryorhynchus has revealed an astonishing fact. They never stopped growing. The longer Cryorhynchus lived, the bigger it got. With a little help from the children of Santana, Dave Martill is recreating what may be the largest cryorhynchus ever found. First unearthed in 1980, it proves that in South America, dinosaurs weren't the only creatures to reach gigantic proportions. Working with the only bones recovered so far, Martil has been able to calculate the animal's wingspan. This is a truly terrifying pterodactyl. This was the largest ever animal to fly. It had a wingspan of almost 40 feet. That is as large as a small aircraft. It really was nature's greatest engineering achievement. that inspired legends of gold and lost worlds has finally relinquished its secrets. South America is, uh, I guess, the latest great place to look for dinosaurs. South America has given us some insight into where dinosaurs came from and what their earliest ancestors looked like. South America, an island in the Cretaceous with its own dinosaur productions, things that would dazzle a North American paleontologist. From Tierra del Fuego to the Amazon jungle, South America has given the world the oldest, the weirdest, and the biggest creatures that ever ruled the world. <laughs>